Well, welcome back to another time in God's Word together. And man, God is really good. And as we wrap up our series, Fast and Pray, I want to talk today about uh, day 22 because we've done 21 days of prayer. And today technically is day 22. Maybe you're watching this even later. All of these principles still apply. So whether you're applying them to day 22 or day 23 or day 47 or day 1057, uh, talking about prayer and looking at that out of God's word is so important. And I wanted to start out and I want to just draw a simple analogy that hopefully will help frame up today for us as we talk about prayer and we talk about day 22 and beyond prayer. But I, I am a father. Uh, I, am, uh, I have three children. And the simple thing that I wanted to start out with this morning is that each of those three children communicates with me, asks things of me as their father in a unique way because they're all different. They're all unique children. And now there are uh, some similar patterns. We use words. We use sounds. We use, uh, in our family, the English language because that's the language that we speak. And so there are some uh, commonalities, if you want to call them that. There's some patterns that stay consistent. And yet, for one of my kids, I a lot of times have to kind of woo things out of them because they're not always as forward with the things that they're asking for. One of my other kids, and again, if you know our kids, you can maybe start putting the names to these, but uh, one of my other kids, sometimes they'll, they won't stop asking. And instead of actually trying to coax or woo and ask out of them, I actually have to be intentionally trying to um, slow down their asking or maybe redirect their asking. And the reason that I bring that up is they're, they're all my kids and I'm the same father. And yet the way that we communicate is varied based on who they are as my children. And again, to remind you, there are patterns that are consistent, and yet the communication is unique. And as we talk about prayer, and as we wrap up our series, I want to lean into prayer today. And there's some patterns that I think are helpful for us. But I also want to recognize as we talk about some patterns here, I want to remind us and maybe introduce for a first time this concept that prayer is relational. Uh, and, and, and if it's relational, then it actually has to take into account the uniqueness of our personalities and our makeups and the way that God leads us, speaks to us, uh, either coaxes us or directs us, depending on who we are and how he talks to us. And so I want to give you freedom in that. I also want to want to challenge you to incorporate some of the patterns that we're going to talk about today because because there are things that are consistent, even though we deal with God in unique ways and he deals with us in unique ways. And so today, what I'd like to do is give you a pattern for prayer that actually comes out of an acronym uh, from a book that I read a couple years ago named How to Pray, which is a fascinatingly creative title. Uh, but it was a very helpful book because it was a very simple book and it addresses very well the title of the book, which is How to Pray. And um, uh, it was written by a gentleman named Pete Gregg, who who actually started the 24-7 prayer movement. And there's a lot of uh, data you can find online, resources and things like that. But today, I want to give us that acronym because that acronym becomes a pattern for prayer. And I, I hope and pray and believe that there's going to be something in here today that breathes on you in a fresh way, that the Holy Spirit would breathe on you in a fresh way, and that you would take something away from this to inspire you or to challenge you, maybe to help you think about something in a new way, maybe actually just to reinforce something that you already knew but needed to be reminded of. And so I want to give you the acronym right up front, and then we'll kind of talk through it. And uh, uh, ready? The acronym for the pattern for prayer is, and this is to help you remember, is PRAY. P-R-A-Y. It's pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. Pause, rejoice, ask, yield, pray. And we're going to walk through that. So number one, let's start out this morning. I want to talk to us about pause. The first thing is P and it's pause. And Psalm 4610 says this, it says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And in our culture today, maybe more than at any culture that's ever lived in the history of the world, it's challenging to pause because there's so much happening and there's so much noise and there's so much access to the world around us through the internet, through social media. And, and, and again, some of those things can be really great, right? But, but uh, one thing that it does challenge us with is actually being still and pausing. And social scientists tell us that our attention deficits are shrinking. Uh, we understand that our, 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 uh, our ability to focus on things is diminishing. Uh, it, it's just very interesting. And so there's a power in pausing. There's a power in the pause. And the, the Bible tells us again, be still and know that I am God. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the story of 
the, uh, the wild dog eating chair. But if you have not, it was very helpful for me in understanding this concept of pausing. So as the story goes, there was a man who was visiting a cafe. He had his dog with him. He was sitting outdoors. And as he was sitting out, he hooked the, uh, the leash of the dog underneath the leg of the chair, maybe around the arm of the chair, I don't recall. And he's sitting, drinking his coffee and reading his book. And uh, he needs to hit the restroom. And so he says to the table next to him, hey, would you watch my stuff? As people do, they said, sure. And he goes inside. As he's inside, the dog, who's relaxed outside but hooked to the chair, hears a noise and it startles the dog. So the dog jumps a little bit. And as the dog jumps, guess what? The chair jumps too, which startles the dog who jumps a little bit larger, which the chair follows suit and jumps a little bit bigger too, which startles the dog even more, who begins to quickly move out of the way and the chair quickly follows the dog to, uh, to, to spark the dog to actually go into a short run. And guess what? The chair begins to chase the dog, which freaks the dog out so that it turns into an all out sprint. And the next thing you know, the dog turns around a corner of a city street with the wild, maniacal dog eating chair chasing the dog down as it's running away. Now, of course, that's a silly example, but I bet you'll remember it as I have. And here's the thing. If the master came out and saw the dog in terror and anxiety running from all the things chasing it, what would the master counsel the dog to do? And of course, maybe the dog wouldn't understand the language, but the master surely would say to the dog, stop. And the dog might answer if it could talk, I can't stop, you don't understand. There's this crazy maniacal dog eating chair that's chasing me. And the master would say, stop. And I, I bet you a lot of the things that are chasing you will stop. And the idea is that how do you stop the maniacal dog eating chair? The, the way you stop it is you stop. And when you stop, the thing chasing you stops. Now, in our world, it's not maniacal dog eating chairs. In our world, it's the demands of our business. Or maybe uh, you can fill in the blank on what it is for you. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the demands of your business will automatically 100% stop. But I will tell you this. If you stop, be still and know that I'm the Lord. The demands of your business, your perspective on them shifts, and you actually start to move into a peace and a joy from the Spirit that actually begins to change your entire life. And so in a very real way, even though the demand of your job may not functionally change, the way you handle the demand of your job absolutely does. And so in a very real way, when you stop, so does the dog-eating maniacal chair. And so I want you to know that in a very real way, if you get nothing else out of our time together this morning, you get nothing else out of God's word today, which I know you're going to get a lot more, but, but here's the deal. Be still and know that I'm God. And there's a power in just pausing and stopping. Blaise Pascal said that most of the world's problems, most of our life's problems can be attributed to our inability to sit alone in a dark room. Something like that. I may have butchered that. It's not in my notes, but something like that. And here's the deal. Just stopping is such a powerful exercise. Pausing. You say, well, Pastor Scott, um, you know, uh, if I stop and I try to start hearing God, like I'm not really sure God's available to speak to me uh, like the way he speaks to so many other people. And can I tell you something? God speaks to every single one of us differently. Yes, there are patterns, but he speaks to us uniquely. And I, I will tell you that the Bible tells us that God is available to speak to us. It may not be in the way we expect. It may not be in the way that he spoke to our friend or our neighbor or our spouse or our kid, but God speaks to us. I actually did uh, a series called Whisper in this past August. And there, one of the teachings in that message was six languages. And we actually went through six different languages that God uses to speak to us as his people. And I bet you that God can use all of those six plus a whole bunch of other ones that we didn't talk about to speak to you. But if you just think that God is going to speak to you in one specific way, and then he doesn't, you might write it off and go, well, God doesn't really speak to me. And I want to encourage you. Yes, he does speak. And the enemy wants to convince us that, you know, well, I'm different and this doesn't work for me and prayer just doesn't work for me. And I want to tell you, I do believe that's the enemy. Here's our belief is, yes, I'm different. Yes, God speaks to me uniquely, but God is with me and God is for me and God does speak to me. And Revelation 3.20 says this, it's a, a prophetic declaration from Jesus. He says this, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with that person and they with me. Now that's, we use that as a salvation scripture sometimes like, oh, if you'll receive Jesus in, but that scripture is actually written to the early church. 
It's written to us, the Jesus followers. And Jesus says, you are a follower of mine, but I'm knocking at the door. And if you'll open the door, I will come in and I will eat with you. Matthew 6, 9 says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. You guys, we need to start our prayers with pausing and slowing down and recognizing, yes, God is here. God is present. Be still and know that I am God. And you might say, Pastor Scott, I don't have time to do that. I got all these pressures and responsibilities. And let me answer that in two ways. Number one, let me just acknowledge that there are different seasons and there are different demands by season. And a young mother with three small kids is a totally different season than that same mom 30 years later as an empty nester, right? Those are different seasons. I recognize that. So there's no condemnation or shame in any of this. But let me now answer in the second way and remind us that there was never a person on the planet who had more demands on their time than Jesus Christ. There was never anyone who understood pressure the way that Jesus did. And Jesus had this practice of pulling aside under the weight of the demands and under the weight of the pressure and with all of the things that he had going on, and he actually pulled aside and sought God. He paused. In Mark 1.35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now that sounds to me like a pause. In Matthew 14.23, it says, After Jesus had sent the crowds away, he went up on a mountain by himself, to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. That sounds like a pause. There's more. There's Luke 6, 12, and on and on and on I could go. But it's these divine pauses. It's making time for prayer. And you say, Pastor Scott, you can't make time. You're right. You cannot make time. You can only invest it in what matters most. And when, I, when we say we need to make time for prayer, we're not saying we're manufacturing time in some way. We're saying we're choosing to spend time on the thing that matters most because ultimately this is not a math problem. Pausing is not a math problem. Well, I'm too busy. I have too many pressures. I don't have time. My calendar doesn't allow for it. It's not a math problem. It's a priority problem. And it's a, it's a belief problem that we don't believe that prayer is necessary. We, we kind of feel like it's a good idea. It's a helpful thing. And what we don't recognize is that it is not a helpful thing. It is a vital foundational thing that sits at the core of who we are as God's people. Uh, we make time for prayer. Again, not making it, but investing it. I want to give you one more analogy here on the pauses. Is this, if you took a, a jar of river water and you shook it up and you set it on a shelf, it would be all cloudy and murky. And you say, man, how can I clear the silt out of the water? How can I get the water to be clear again so that I could see clearly through it? And the answer is, don't touch it. <laughs> just leave it on the shelf, right? Just, just pause. Set the, set the jar on the shelf and pause. And so many of us, you guys, we have to learn to do that in our life. And in our society, men, it's so hard right now with all of the noise and all the pressure. But if anybody could ever do it, if anybody ever understood the pressure and the time uh, constraints, it was Jesus and he did it. And we can do it too. Be still and know that I am God. God, Psalm 46, 10. It's not a math issue. It's a value issue. It's about what we believe. So. Let's pause. Let's make the, uh, the, the maniacal dog-eating chair stop chasing us by stopping the run. Set the jar on the shelf. Turn off your phone. Pull aside like Jesus did alone. Pause and pray. Be still and know that I'm God. Now, took a little bit more time on that one than I will on the others, but I want to give you the rest of these. Number two is to rejoice. So pause, rejoice. Uh, Philippians 4.4 4 says, rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. Let me remind us that prayer is first relational, not transactional. So what does that mean? What it means is this, is that we don't go into prayer first asking. We'll get to that in a second, but we go into prayer first by pausing and then rejoicing. And rejoicing is actually relational, not transactional. Uh, when, years ago, I sold software for a company called Agate Software, and I would travel around the country when we would uh, close business and I remember I'd go on trips and sometimes I would come home and as a father coming home, right, I'd step through the door 
and I have three kids. And again, they would all respond differently. And, and some of them would respond differently just based on the season or, or maybe what they were doing at that moment when I walked in the door. But, but sometimes they would, they would run up to me and maybe one of them would run up and they would say, what did you bring me? And, and that was a fine response because I did bring them something and I would always get them a little gift and they loved that. And, and then maybe one of them would run up and say, dad, you're home. And, and, uh, you know, and then kind of, you know, run past, maybe hug my leg, run out and, and they begin to play again. But then maybe one of them on my trip home would run up and say, Dad, Daddy, I missed you so much and, and hook on to my leg or try to crawl up with me. And maybe I would go sit on the couch and maybe they would snuggle up in my lap and we would just have a moment together. Now, here's what I want you to know. All three of my kids were my kids equally in that moment. And I loved all three of my kids the same in that moment. But the one that ran and asked me what I brought them and the one who came and said, hey, what up, Pop? And gave me five and ran out and played. And then the third that actually snuggled up in my lap, that third one had an intimate moment with their father that the other two didn't have. They're all my kids. I love them all the same. But the one actually experienced not a transactional relationship, but an intimacy. And that act of unnecessary affection, that act of unnecessary delight, that act of unnecessary rejoicing in the father coming home meant that there was a moment of relational intimacy that was not just transactional. It, it increased and expanded on the experience that that child had with their father. And Dutch Sheets says it this way. He said, I attended God's house, but I did not know God personally. We referenced going to connect to God's church, but I had never connected to his heart. I had known the promise of religion, but never the pleasure of his company. I, wasn't not, I was not a hypocrite. I simply did not know how to connect with God in a personal way. And some of us feel this way, and I think sometimes it's because we make prayer transactional instead of personal. P. Gregg said it this way. He said, prayer is relational, not transactional. Most people's biggest issue with prayer is God. Uh, I'll say their perception of God. That's what he's getting at. He says, most people envision God scowling, perpetually disapproving, disappointed, and needing to be placated or persuaded in prayer. If that's how you picture God, I really don't blame you for trying to avoid his gaze. Jesus has made it clear in the parable of the prodigal son that, drum roll please, God is on our side. And I'm here today to remind you, or maybe tell you for a first time, that God is on your side and that prayer is not just a transactional, you know, you walk up to the vending machine and put the dollar in and hit A7 and the right chips fall out. But that prayer is actually more like your father coming home from a business trip. Again, I know it's a mixed analogy and God is God and he doesn't come home from business trips, but you're tracking me, right? Is that when we see our father, we run up to him and we hug him and we wrap our arms around him and we snuggle up with him. And you might go, that sounds weird to me. I don't, I don't know that I like that. Well, you know what? I understand that. But it is fascinating, isn't it? That the, the Lord's prayer, when they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. Do you know the first thing he said? He said, pray like this. Our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And we start prayer not with asking for something from God. What did you bring me? We start prayer by saying, God, you're my father. God, I pause. And now God, I rejoice. God, thank you. Thank you for making me. God, thank you for creating me. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for pulling me out of the miry clay and setting my feet on a rock. God, I don't know where I would be without you. Or God, maybe I do know where I would be without you. And God, I'm just here to tell you again today how much I love you and how much I appreciate you. And God, all that you've done for me and my family. And God, I, I love you and I'm thankful. And we begin to rejoice. We begin to enjoy. And so that's what we do. Relationship changes our perspective on our life. And our perspective on our life changing is all about being in relationship, not a transaction. Because A7 and the chips falling out doesn't change our perspective. But rejoicing in God and being with Him in a relational way absolutely does. And just some practicals here. Uh, we can read the Psalms, which is the prayer book in the Bible. Uh, we can uh, worship through music. We can thank God for uh, the blessings that He's given us, but even more, the blessing of Him and who He is. And you might say, well, should I be thanking God uh, at times when I don't really feel thankful? That, is that fake? I don't think it's fake. I actually think it means even more because you say, God, I'm choosing today to, to, to find gratitude and rejoice in you even when I'm not emotionally feeling it. And that seems significant to me. 
but we make rejoicing a huge part of our prayer life because Philippians 4, 4 says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. And this is really what we're made for, you guys. We, we pause and we rejoice. And that leads us to A, pray, right? Pause, rejoice, ask, ask. This is what many of us think about prayer. But what I've learned as I've walked through things like this with people is this seems to be the most obvious step for some people, but for some people, they actually never get to this step. For some people, they live in pause and rejoice and they love to listen to worship and they, they relationally connect with God in an abstract way and they never actually get to asking. So wherever you come from on that, um, ask is an important part of prayer. And petition is when we ask for ourselves and intercession is when we ask for someone else. But asking is a big part of prayer. And the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, right? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's pause and, and rejoice. Um, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We'll talk about that in a minute. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. God, I have needs. And God, I'm asking of you. God, give us, give us what we need today. And this is where we begin to ask God. And Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says this. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened. For everybody who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. And there's this idea in the scripture, all through the scripture, that we are supposed to ask God. And I love Matthew here because this is written in what they call a continuous present tense. What does that mean? You say, it means it's an ongoing present tense. So it's, it, it could be read like this, ask and keep asking and it will be given to you. Seek and continue daily, momentarily seeking and you'll find. Knock and keep knocking and it'll be open to you. So that continuous present tense. And so that's really, really important for us as we talk about prayer. And you might ask the question, Pastor Scott, if God knows, because he's God, right? So like if God already knows what I need, why would I like ask him? Like, why would I put that into an ask? Great question. You know, it's interesting in the scripture, we have a story of a man named Blind Bartimaeus. And he's a, a blind man who is a beggar on the side of the road. And actually, if you get into the biblical history, beggars typically would have had a cloak that would have signified them as a beggar, as a blind person, um, so that people would know, oh, they're blind, they need help. And then you would go and you'd give them money or support or whatever. And so there was actually a cloak that would signify his blindness. And blind Bartimaeus is sitting on the side of the road, probably with a blinder, like a, a cloak that represents his blindness on. And it says, as he hears Jesus passing by, he, he yells out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they try to silence him. He's like, get off me. Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus comes over and looks at blind Bartimaeus and says this, what do you want me to do for you? And it's fascinating, right? Because anybody watching the exchange would be like, Jesus, do you not have eyes? Are you blind? Because blind Bartimaeus is blind. He has a blind beggar's cloak on. You know what he needs. You know what he wants. Why are you asking him what, <laughs> what you can do for him? And there seems to be something in the scripture where even though God knows what we need, he wants us to put voice to that as we pray with him. And you know, for blind Bartimaeus, he says, I want to see. And then, of course, Jesus heals him, and there's that whole exchange. But what's fascinating to me about that, beyond the healing, which is amazing, is that Jesus knows what he needs and still says, what do you want me to do for you? There's another uh, kind of interesting story, right, where there's a man who's been lame for all of these years, and he's by the pool of Bethesda, and Jesus says, do you want to be made well? <laughs> Like, do we need to laugh at that? Like, Jesus, do you not already know? And what's fascinating to me about that is that as the man is asked, do you want to be well? He doesn't say yes. He actually begins to give all of these excuses about why he can't get well. And as he's giving all of the excuses and as he's in it, he's honestly kind of in a self-pity party. Jesus, the one who can heal him, is standing there waiting. And what I think is fascinating, you guys, is that God wants us to put voice to our asks even when he already knows what we need. You say, why? Well, because there's tension there. And God wants us to lean into that tension, maybe so that we can work out what we actually do need. Some of us don't know what we need or know what we want. And as we have to put it into words or, or write it down in a journal, we have to wrestle with that tension. For some of us, uh, maybe we want something that we shouldn't want. We have to wrestle with that tension. Um, maybe for some of us, we're asking what the Bible would say is amiss, and we need to go back and we need to reassess that. Maybe for some of us, we have a question behind the question or a need behind the need, and actually asking it makes us actually do the work to go and figure out what we're actually truly 
asking for the question behind the question. Sometimes that gets us to the motivations in our hearts. Sometimes that gets us to a disappointment that we had somewhere. On and on and on it goes. Sometimes it changes our understanding of things or changes our perspective. Sometimes uh, it's so that we can know that God was moving in the thing we asked for because, you know, I'm famous for, uh, in my own personal life, for just kind of abstractly asking God something. And then I would have no idea if he was actually answering that question. But when we ask specifically and we actually put into words what we're asking of God, we can actually look back and go, look how he moved. And it's not always how we think or in the timing that we think, but we actually have something to reference back to. Sometimes it's so that we can learn to help others learn to ask. As we learn to ask or as we're asking out loud or in a prayer meeting or writing in our journal, sometimes that correlates to something someone else might want to ask for or helping them clarify what they're looking for. So here's the big idea here. God wants us to ask even when he already knows what we need. And I'll give you a couple quick practicals on this, but I'm going to give them to you all three and then we'll break them down. But is we need to learn to pray God's promises. We need to learn to pray consistently and we need to pray incre- learn to pray incrementally. And I'll start with the last one first. We need to start to learn to pray incrementally. Now, as I said, I'm a big picture person. I like to pray abstract prayers. Uh, but God... Uh, if he's working, it would be more helpful to be more specific, right? So you could see and you, you, could, you could wrestle with that tension. And, you know, so for example, we might pray for a miracle in our healing. We might say, God, would you just take away this ailment? And God can do that. And sometimes he does that. And I, it's fine to ask for that. But maybe also what you could do learning to pray incrementally is to say, God, at my next doctor's appointment, would you help me get to the doctors or to the people that would actually be able to help identify what's truly going on at the root? God, would you give the doctors wisdom? And God, or, or God, maybe if you're on a medication, God, this medication's not working. God, would you help give the wisdom to my medical team and God, even to me and to my family about an adjustment or an adaptation we can make? to help me experience a greater level of health. Now, I'm just saying, you you can see how, that's just an example, but you can see how you start to pray incrementally. Sometimes you say, oh God, would you give me a million dollars? God, would you just solve all of my financial problems? Would you give me five million, $10 million? Would you just drop it in a box down? I wanna just find it in in an alley uh, as I'm going to work or whatever. Um, He he usually doesn't do that. Uh, But we could pray this, God, your word says that it's you that gives me the power and ability to get wealth on the earth so that I can establish your covenant. God, would you help me find favor and the wisdom to know uh, how to step into a new job? How, God, would you direct me into uh, a career? God, would you give me favor with my boss for a raise that I'm gonna ask for? And God, would you help me know how to ask for that raise and when to ask for that raise? And God, I'm asking you to speak to me. So here's the deal. We're not asking for a million dollars to float down in a box. We're asking God to give us favor and wisdom and direction in engaging our current workplace or actually potentially in leading us to a different one. Now, that's the kind of way that we wanna incrementally pray. So here's the question. What is the next little prayer that you can pray as a step toward the larger, more abstract prayer you've already been praying? That's helpful as we ask. The next thing here is we learn to pray God's promises. You know, when we pray in Jesus's name, it doesn't just mean that we throw Jesus's name on the end of a prayer that we pray out of our own will. Again, God doesn't have a problem with us asking out of our own will. He tells us to do that. But when we pray in Jesus's name, we're praying according to the will and directive of God. And when you can find a scripture that you can tie into into the ask, uh, that is incredibly powerful. And I will say it this way, We do not have an ask of the Lord and then go find a scripture to tie in, to give us validation and kind of chicken arm God into actually doing it. It's as we read scripture, it clarifies and purifies our asking. And we learn to pray God's promises. And then thirdly, we learn to pray consistently. And I love this analogy, but they said, uh, someone said that prayer is like throwing pebbles into a swamp. You, you begin to pray, you begin to throw that pebble and it goes into the water and it sinks to the bottom and you can't even see it. And you're like, was that even, was that even fruitful? Did that do anything at all? And then you do it again and you do it again and you do it again. But over time, as you continue to throw that prayer and to throw that pebble, eventually you start to throw that pebble and you see that begin to crest above the waterline and you see the, the outcome of all of those prayers. And we want to continue to pray consistently. And again, kind of our verse for today, as we've been looking at is Matthew 7, 7, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. That's the New Living Translation. And again, it it picks up that continuous present tense right there in that translation. 
Let me say it like this. Keep throwing the stones in petition for yourself and in intercession for others. Keep throwing the stones because we ask for ourselves and we ask for others. And that's the third part of the pattern today is we ask. And that leads me to the fourth and final, which is this. It's the why. It's yield. So we pause, we rejoice, we ask, and then we yield. And the yield, Matthew 6, 10, it says, uh, the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I talked all last week about lily work, and I would encourage you to go back and listen to that. It's about having the Spirit work in our lives in the places where other people don't see. And that's where we're starting to get at here with this yield moment. It's, it's the part of prayer where we confess our sin. It's the part of prayer where we repent for the places where we've gone too far or not gone far enough, or we've, we've, uh, we've done things that we shouldn't have done and we knew we shouldn't have done it. And the place where we receive God's grace and we part with our shame. Uh, this is the place where we offer forgiveness to other people and ask God to help us forgive other people because it's hard. This is the place where we pray, God, God, would you search me and know me? God, would you, any displeasing way in me, would you reveal it to me? Oh God, if there's anything in me that doesn't look like you and sound like you and act like you, God, would you reveal it to me and would you help me, God, overcome it? This is the part in our prayer life where we go to the, the, the Garden of Gethsemane prayer. If you don't know what that is, it's before Jesus goes to the cross in Luke twenty two forty two. 42, he prays this. He says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. And in the place of yielding is the place where we say, God, come and sweep my entire house. Come and look at every corner, every closet, every nook and every cranny. That's what we talked about last week with Lily work, that, that work in the private place. We say, oh God, I yield to you today. You're, you're my God. You sit on the throne of my heart. You're my Lord and Savior. God, this entire life is for you. And God, I ask you to come and to reveal to me. And, and God, I confess of my sin. And God, I repent for whatever it might be. My anger, my uh, uh, my my. Um, my judgment on that person, God, uh, wh whatever it is, God, uh, would you come? God, would you help me to forgive? God, would help me wrestle with the tensions in my own heart? God, would you come and search me and know me? And God, I surrender to your will. And, you know, these kind of prayers are, are the kinds of prayers that bring power into our life and really healing and freedom into our life. The house is not off limits. Every drawer, every nook, every cranny, every corner, the whole house, my whole house, this is the yielding kind of prayer. And this is where we can deal with sin and shame and forgiveness and our assignment, our calling in life. Uh, we, this is where we deal with humility and trust and, and giving and grieving and serving and relationships and on and on and on it goes, where we say, oh God, I pause today. God, be still and know that I'm God. I, I just stop and the chair stops. I stop and yeah, I can't make time, but I can invest time in what matters most. And God, teach me, God, how to pause and how to stop. Let the river water become clear again. And then God, I rejoice. Jesus, I thank you for who you are. Father, I thank you for, for loving me today, right where I am. I thank you that I'm a son, that I'm a daughter. God, I thank you for creating the world and God, putting breath in my lungs today. And God, I run through, God, my gratitude for the gifts that you've put in my hands. And ultimately, God, you're the greatest gift. And I thank you for my relationship with you. And God, if you never did another thing for me, which you do and so much, but God, if you never did another thing, God, saving my soul and bringing me into relationship with you, God, it's beautiful. And God, I rejoice in you today. And then asking, God, you already know what I need, but God, you ask me to ask. And so, God, I begin to put my petitions before you, God. I, my, I come in intercession and I ask for others. And, and God, I ask and God, I clarify and I wrestle and I look at my motivations and God, I make my, my journal entries and I say, God, this is what I need in my life. And I learned to pray that incrementally and I learned to pray that consistently and I learned to pray that according to God's promises. And that leads me to yielding, God. God, would you come and have every part of me God, in a fresh way, be my God today. And I surrender to you. You're my Lord and my Savior. God, you're the King. You're on the throne of my heart. You are the, the navigator and the, the captain of my life. And so God, I thank you for that today. And God, I submit myself to you and I humble myself to you. And you guys, that's prayer. P-R-A-Y. Pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. And remember this, that's a pattern. And it's helpful for all of us, I believe that. And I believe God spoke something to you today about that, that you can implement into your prayer life. Because remember, it's not transactional, it's relational. And I want to remind you of this. I have three kids and they all speak to me different. And although there are patterns that are consistent, the way that they speak to me and I call on them, it's unique. And I want to give you that permission today.
Let me pray for us as we close. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you, God, for taking us deeper into the place of prayer, which really is deeper into the place of relationship with you. And God, right now, I pray for anybody that doesn't know you. They've never started that personal relationship with you. They think maybe, maybe they've thought prayer is silly. Maybe they've thought prayer doesn't really do anything. God, we know that you speak and you lead and you guide and God, that you come with your peace and sometimes you come with your nearness and sometimes, God, we don't hear from you and it feels like we're talking to a brick wall and, and yet, God, you're present in that still. Your silence and your absence are not the same thing. And so, God, we trust you. And so, God, I pray for anybody that's never started that relationship with you today and they wanna do that, God, I pray right now for them. And God, I want to just, uh, I want to lead you. If that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer just to receive Jesus. You can just pray this with me. Just say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. And I believe that you came to pay for my sin and to bring me back into right relationship with God, my father and creator. And I receive that sacrifice for my sin right now. I thank you, God, for your grace over my life. And I receive salvation, eternal life by grace through faith right now. And God, I thank you that in your word, it says that something new is birthed on the inside of me. And God, that a new life is springing forward. And I thank you for that. And God, I wanna live my life with you. I surrender to you. I yield to you. God, teach me how to pray. Teach me how to walk with you. Teach me how to to love and to live with you and through you. And I thank you for that today in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we'd love to hear from you. You can text the keyword element to 97,000. Let us know. The Bible says that All the angels in heaven are celebrating as you pray that prayer. And we're celebrating as well. And so glad that you're here today. And just for the rest of us that have already prayed that prayer, have already made that step of faith to say, Jesus, I need you in my life and I surrender to you, God. I wanna usher us all now just into a time of prayer as our team worships over us. I want you to ask, what's the one thing that you heard the loudest today from the Holy Spirit? And what is the one thing that you need to do this week in your prayer life because of what you heard? Let's go into a time of prayer. Love you guys so much. And we will see you back here next week.